Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything movies, TV, comics, and entertainment. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast. What's happening, everybody? My name is Ken M. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Well, let me talk to you. Yeah, and boy, do we have a lot to talk about in the land of movies, TV, comics, and more. You are tuned into the entertainment edition of the ODPH, and we definitely like having those conversations continue after the show. So, Pad, where does everybody go? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. Swing on over to the website. Join in on all the social media accounts. Keep those conversations rolling. We've seen an uptick in users which we love seeing so we definitely like having those conversations about the parlay of topics you hear each and every week on the show also remember to check out the t public store link you never know when there's gonna be a new item that pops up and you also don't know when there's gonna be a sale dropping there as well so if you want to support the odph in that manner by all means do it when it's on sale we always encourage that and if you're talking about supporting the brand well there's one way you can always do it and you get a little something extra for it and that is the patreon one tier, $2 a month, and they were gifted with an early release of a very, very special episode, Pat. Oh, yeah? So I don't want to spoil anything because oh. it's going to be one that uh, a lot of people are going to be talking about because I'm super excited about it, and especially going into one of our favorite seasons here at the show, and that's WrestleMania season. Hmm. If you want to find out, you got to sign up for the Patreon or just be patient when we drop it there, but patrons get it early, and you can hear their reactions that's earlier than everybody else, so boom. It's a win-win situation. Also at the website, check out the blog section. We're always dropping reviews left and right. Check out the classified section where we have friends of the show, such as 3FN Podcast. Great episode this week, too, by the way. Nice. They're always finding great work, but it's really good episode this week. Uh, Dragon Master Games, Nerd Initiative. A lot of things on the horizon there, my friends. I bet. Oh, just wait. The Home of Pop Culture Positivity has got a big 2024 plan. So if you want to find out, you can go check them out, on, as well as all the other links involved with the classified section, because, hey, we'd like to promote a lot there. And then the directory, because we're on a lot of providers. But, Pat, how many providers are we on? Uh, we are on uh, 610,233. I don't question him, because he is a statistician to the stars. Also, check out the music section of the show, where we have such great musicians as Brian Wolf and the Howlers, Second Suitor, Tom Jolu, Floodlands, Shout at the Robots, and many, many more that are so gracious and kind to give us their music to play uh, commercial-free here on the show and it's always great to give you know a little shout out to the local musicians we know because they're absolutely amazing people and you should go check out all their stuff and if i forgot anything because hey it does happen if it's anything and everything it is the odph you can find it odphpodcast.com and if you're using social media hashtags except on threads right now use the hashtag odph pod it's coming there too but we want to get more of a coverage there as well so it's you know threads is still developing but we do work in progress we do love threads get a lot of great interaction there but enough about that. We want to talk some entertainment with you, and so let's kick the show off with a recap of one of our, I would say, most interesting in, ugh, interesting shows. See, I get so tongue-tied when I talk about it. I just make the mistakes. But it's one of the most interesting shows on TV right now, mm-hmm. causing a lot of varying reactions. And, Pat, what is that show? That would be the spinoff show or latest spinoff show in the Walking Dead universe titled The Ones Who Live. Yeah, the return of Rick Grimes, played by Andrew Lincoln, and Michonne, played by Denai Guerrero, of the Walking Dead universe, has got the fan base talking. Mm-hmm. And a lot of mixed reaction I've been picking up on with this series because we had heard so much about this after both stars left the show. They have returned in this manner. We first heard it was going to be a movie, then it was going to be a TV show. So now we're at the penultimate episode for season one, maybe the show series finale. We don't, we don't know yet, but we have hit a, a, a point in the show that definitely had fans talking this weekend if you're in the Walking Dead fandom. So we are going to be recapping that episode entitled Become. Now, if you're new to the ODPH, first and foremost, thank you for checking us out. We do appreciate it. Drop a review on your favorite podcatcher. We like to give a spoiler-free statement about what we're going to be talking about. Then we give you a countdown. After said countdown... We go deep diving into spoilers. We don't hold anything back, so if you don't want to be spoiled for whatever reason, it's all good. Mm -hmm. Jump out of the episode at that point. Pause it. Watch what you need to catch up with, and then jump back in because after that spoiler countdown is on, it is fair game. 
So that being said, Pad, give me your spoiler-free statement about episode five entitled Become for the Walking Dead, the ones who live. The episode was okay, and I don't mean that in like a positive way. I don't mean that in a negative way. It was like middle of the road. You know, I didn't come out of it going, wow, that was amazing. That was the best hour plus because, you know, no Walking Dead show these days ends at exactly an hour. Mm. You know, and I didn't come out of it going, well, fuck, there's, you know, an hour plus of my time. I could have been better spent watching anything else. It happened. It had a beginning, a middle and end, you know, and there was some stuff in there that I, I thought was interesting. But the biggest thing to me, and I know we were talking about this off air pre-show, it felt to me that they, the the series had been originally written, you know, for five episodes. Mm-hmm. And, and like, like you alluded to, it, when this project first started, it was going to be a theatrical release. When, when we say movie release, they were talking at one point, and I'm sure if you dig through enough of the internet, you'll find the, the part where Scott Gimple talked about it. They were going to originally release this in theaters. Right. And then it switched to, oh, we're going to do a movie, but we're going to release it on AMC. And then it switched to, oh, we're just going to do a TV series. But it, it felt like whatever this amalgamation of a project was over the course of the years was only going to be like whatever the runtime equates out to minus an episode. And they and it felt like for this episode where the scenes certainly make sense from a storytelling perspective, you know, mm-hmm. and we'll get into that once we get into spoilers. And if you've seen the episode, you know what I'm talking about mm-hmm. from a certain perspective, they make sense. But for me, not for an entire episode. And to me, it kind of felt like AMC or the powers that be, because I can't see Scott M. Gimple, who's, you know, the showrunner, master of the universe on, on all things Walking Dead television, turning around and going, hey, these are two really great sequences we got for this for this epi- for the, this one episode. Why don't we turn it into its own full fledged thing? Mm hmm. It, you know, I can't see him doing that, but if it feels like they turned around and they took this, the, the AMC or somebody, some higher up there went, hey, can you, we, need, we, we know you've got five episodes, but we really need six. Can you come up with something for six? And they're just like, yeah, I guess we can flesh this out a little bit more because, you know, nothing. There was one earth shattering, I guess you could say, but I'm using like a lowercase. It's not like, oh, my God, mm-hmm. you know, the Macaulay Culkin Home Alone shock face wasn't me on Sunday. You know, there was one moment that I'm like, oh, wow, okay. Like, that was a little surprising that they decided to do that there. But for the rest of the episode, it was just kind of like I'm checking my watch going, how much longer have we got? This reminded me of a Titans finale. Oh, yikes. So, I, I, like we touched upon there, it really seemed like there was an end point to this story. Uh-huh. And we're counting all five episodes now. Right. And it felt like they just added more onto this to try giving it more gravity. Right. And tried really connecting with the audience. And I think they missed their mark. Right. I think there's a couple moments in this episode, and we'll get into it in spoilers, that are big. But are they game changer? Right. No. I don't think they are. I think there is one moment, too, where I had to kind of pause and go, oh, that is a thing. Okay, Uh I forgot about that. So when we start going into where this ultimately ends up, it just kind of felt like they really added on stuff where if they just kept it simpler, right, it would have been better. But I agree with you. It, it feels like they got rolling and maybe everybody felt the magic was back. Uh-huh. You know, having the you know, the two stars of the show return, like maybe we have more story to tell, right? which is great. Right. But it felt like... They could have ended this episode 45 minutes mm-hmm. and walked away and everybody would have been happy. 45 minutes, including commercials, which would have been your standard television show length. Right. They could have done that. Yeah. And it would have been fun. Yeah. But it felt like they added on just enough extra that you're going like, yeah. all right, is this supposed to be the finale or is this the season premiere too? You know what it felt like to me? It felt like if you remember back to your college days. Where you're writing a paper, midterm paper, final paper, or even just a paper middle of the semester. And and it needs to be a certain number of words. It let's, we'll just say it needs to be 1,000 words. And you're sitting at like 650 words. Mm-hmm. And you can't think of anything 
possibly more to put in that paper to get it to that thousand words. And you just start adding fluff pieces and words and, and other stuff and unnecessarily long sentences that just extend out the word count to get you to that thousand. Yeah. That's what this felt like. Fully agree. I think that that's a great analogy for it because honestly, it could have been shorter to the point and had, yeah. had a bigger reaction. Yeah. But we didn't get a bigger reaction here. It kind of was like, okay, are we starting or ending? And I don't know where. And if this moment that is the big coup de grace, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, it, it's it's not connecting with me because me nor me. I mean, it it should have been a moment where I was like pumping my fist, going, "All right, finally!" Because yeah. like the moment was one that I had been anticipating for a while now, you know, (laughs) but when it came time for it, given the fact that we don't know if this is going to be a one and done for this show, we don't know if it's going to come back for season two. I'm, I'm going with right now. It's a one and done, but I'm not ruling out a possibility for something down the road, Mm -hmm. you know, in a couple of years, much like, you know, the time in between when both Rick and Michonne were on the show to when they came back. So when, when that moment occurred, I was like, okay, this, this makes sense. Yeah, but unfortunately, like I say, a lot of question marks with this one, but let's take the deeper dive, and we'll be able to flesh out a little more about this. So in three, two, one, Pad, talk to me. Episode was okay. Middle of the road, you know, not great, not awful. You know, I watched it, and, you know, the interesting character development they did with Jadis at the start, you know, threw me for a second, and maybe that was because I I got a message on my phone and I missed the whole started the episode where they might've said two years prior, but like I looked up and I saw Gabriel on screen and I went, Oh wait, what the fuck? What is going on? Mm. You know that while I understood it felt a little forced and a little dragged out to be honest with you, you know, and then the whole payoff moment at the end of the episode with Jadis finally getting killed, you know, where, where I, I, they tried pulling the will they won't they, they tried pulling the, you know, oh, if you kill me, Alexandria's gone. If I get bitten, Alexandria's gone. If you try and run away, Alexandria's gone. Like, they tried pulling the, you know, the conflicting decision card. Mm-hmm. What are they going to do? Our heroes have are, are faced with impossible odds. But then, you, like, you sat there and, like, it just played out. And it was kind of like, eh, okay. Like, glad she's gone because she's a pain in the ass. But, you know, it wasn't the most satisfying thing. So the episode overall was just okay. I think what the biggest problem here was, and it's nothing against Pollyanna McIntosh's performance. Right. A hundred percent. I want to stress that. Janice has always been not a main villain. Right. So putting her as the main antagonist thus far with this series, fans are supposed to get more connected with. Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't think the writing really reflected that. Right. And I think that when they started dipping back into the past, because I will be honest, I legit forgot about there was a thing between her and Father Gabriel. So did I. You know, who who Seth G- uh, Gillum reprised his role for this uh, episode. I honestly forgot. So when I started seeing it, it wasn't like this big moment where I was like, oh, we're back here. Well, and that's what threw me initially because, I, like I said, I got a message right as the episode started, so I was looking at that, and they might have shown the whole two years prior thing at the start, and I missed it. If I if I did, this is my fault. But he showed up on the screen at the start, and I went, oh, okay, so he's going to factor into the story in some capacity. Mm-hmm. And then the story played out. They didn't go east. They went west. Yeah. And then you get the partway through the episode, I saw the two years earlier thing, and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. This is weird. It's weird, and it's it's just something that when they kick off with, like you alluded to, we see Father Gabriel meeting up with Jadis, and apparently they've been doing this once a year. And they, this is super early into her time with the CRM, it feels like. Right. So there's a lot of this, like, odd feel to this moment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when they start conversing about, you know, the, their relationship, yep. this is where Jadis kind of dives in about her commitment to the CRM Uh and it's the initial statement, but she's like so bought into what's happening that she almost ignores Gabriel. Right. And she's just really demonstrating, you know, how she's divided about 
what the CRM is doing, but she loves the mission so much. Right. And it, it's like a it's a very polarizing situation for me because as a viewer, I'm watching. I'm like, well, are you in or are you not? But they're trying to establish much like when Rick was first there. Mm-hmm. You know the the confusion aspect, and they were trying to do this. Meanwhile, Gabriel is being the voice of reason, so to speak. Right. And you know he's still trying to talk to. Jadis about like how she's still a good person Mm -hmm. and then it kind of flips to you know where they're going back and forth about like what she should do with him right and it's one of the situations where like I say if there was more investment of their time but honestly it's a forgotten moment on the show yeah unless you're a super fan which if you are I mean if you and you enjoyed it by all means but for somebody that we watch right a lot of Walking Dead except Worlds Beyond uh this is was a moment that I was like, wait, what? Like, what's the connection here? And you know, wasn't Rosita and, and him mm-hmm, together? Mm-hmm. Like, that was the questions I was having. Yeah. So that took me out of this. So then, when we jump to the present, we know that Rick and Michonne are on the run since they made their big escape from the crash site of the helicopter. Right. They're planning on going back to Alexandria, and they made the comment at the end of the last episode. They had the hybrid vehicle, and they had more than enough gasoline to get back to Alexandria. Mm -hmm. And they went west. Yeah. For what reason? We have reasons. (laughs) It was just reasons. Reasons. We have no idea. No. Uh, Like I say, there was no real good excuse for what they were doing, but on their way, they get uh, ambushed Mm -hmm. by... Some bandits, yeah. robbers, thieves, however you want to describe it. Desperate individuals. Yes. I, I know the, the the common terminology was bandits, but I'm like, yeah. but they didn't really look like that. No. They were, like, their actions, it was just like a family that was just scared. Yeah. And obviously in the zombie apocalypse, like, that makes a ton of sense because you can't trust anybody. Yeah, as we've seen. Yeah, so they wind up, uh, Rick and Michonne, getting the upper hand, preventing them from, you know, getting robbed. Yep. They wind up setting up shop in, I believe it was Yellowstone? Yeah, it was. Yeah, they went to Yellowstone. Yeah, so they wound up in Yellowstone National Park. So as they're sleeping, they get woken up by who, Pad? Jadis. Yep, who has tracked them down because... She she, knows how they think. Yeah, which... Okay. Sure. I'm just... I I attributed that to her training from the CRM. Yeah. Because that's the only reason... That and I Any like sense. that, and there are certain instances where Rick likes to think he's real clever and he's real sneaky and he throws people off his scent, but he's really not. Yeah, and this situation, obviously, they knew Jadis was coming for them because of the missing helicopter. They wanted to leave no survivors. Well, I'm not entirely sure they thought that because they were pretty nonchalant about everything up to this point in the episode, even up to when uh they were held at gunpoint by the bandits because they're like, they're like just chilling they're like going out it's like a vacation to them well you know what because i think i think what they were thinking is okay the building the helicopter crashed into is gone mm-hmm. it it's reduced to rubble anyone who gets up there is going to see that and realize there's no survivors so they were taking it well, like a vacation well that's the old thing too you have to also factor in Rick and Michonne are back together. They're yeah. they're in that honeymoon phase, so to speak, yeah. where it's them against the world. Nothing can stop us, and they're not thinking clearly. Mm-hmm. Which I'm sorry, in the zombie apocalypse, as it's been shown time and time again, yep, you gotta be have your your a game on at all points. Got to have your head on a swivel. Yeah. So when Jadis, you know, shows up, she uh, winds up like restraining them and she's giving her monologue like what she's doing like it's almost like she's trying to talk herself into it yeah she does but she she gets there uh they're asleep she wakes them up out of their sleep and so they she's got the upper hand because she's got a gun pointed at them and they're unarmed Mm -hmm. so she ties they're not handcuffs i think she tosses like zip ties or like like the the ones you see officers use where like you, you wrap the hands on them um so she they put those on and then she's like ready to lead them out but then she forgets who she's dealing with and they fight back. Mhm. So during this ordeal, Jess takes a bad shot. Yeah, she does. Too. Um so she is wounded. Mhm. They escape and she goes chasing after them so they almost have they have this impromptu car chase. Yeah, they do. Which I you know, after seeing The Walking Dead for so many years... Uh, we have not seen a car chase. We have not seen this before. Yeah. At least nothing that stood out to this level. Right. And then, 
obviously <laughs> Rick Rick does not want to do anything to her, and Michonne's like, nah, fuck that. She's gotta die. Michonne understands the assignment, folks. Michonne is doing no wrong this entire se- no, don't. season. Rick is like, nah, don't hurt her. Yeah. Michonne's like, nah. Yeah. She she's done. Yeah. Michonne is is the MVP of the season, hands down. Yes. So as you know, they they wind up es- escaping or <laughs> going there. Like mm-hmm. I say, Jadis does get some recruits. Yeah, the bandits. Yeah. So after Rick and Michonne try hiding out, so to speak, they get yet again surprised by said bandits again. Right, because uh, Jadis fed him a line of BS about, oh, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Yeah. And yeah, how'd that go for him? Mm-hmm. So yeah, so as, as they're abandoning this building, sure enough, <laughs> that Rick and Michonne get caught up in this mess again. Mm-hmm. And this is where Jadis is now saying once again about Rick has to come back. Yep. I, there's a dog. She's, she's even willing to make the deal to let uh, Michonne leave. Yeah. Because now, because she's she's obsessed she, with bringing him back. She's obsessed with bringing him back, and I think she, listen, she started this journey off in Philadelphia. For those of you who don't live in the United States, open up Google Maps, enter Philadelphia, and then enter Yellowstone National Park. It's not a simple walk. Right. It, it is a sizable distance, even to drive. It's a couple of days. Mm-hmm. You know, so she's gone, and it and it's also three quarters of the way across the country. Uh, so she's been chasing them for probably weeks at this point. She's just fed up. She's probably hungry, tired, wants a shower and wants to go home. Yeah. And, and at this point, she's like, you know what? I'm tired of this nonsense. Rick, as long as you come along with me and you agree to not pull any fancy moves on me, Michonne can leave and I'll let her go. Pad, you might not know this movie, but if any listeners do, this reminded me of Tommy Lee Jones and the Fugitive. I heard it. I've seen bits and pieces. I have not seen the whole thing. That was the vibe I was getting here, that she went full time Lee Jones, which is not bad, but it was like we're going back to the same old thing, like yeah. relentless. I don't want to say bounty hunter, but, I mean, obviously, Tommy Lee Jones is, was an officer of the law at the time, so like there, there's a difference in that. Uh, just for our international listeners, because I looked it up, uh, the shortest distance between uh, this, according to Google search, and this is according to distancecalculator.to, mm-hmm. uh, the shortest distance airline uh, air space line between Yellowstone National Park and Philadelphia is 1,820.11 miles or uh, 2,929.18 kilometers. Yeah. It, it's it's a little ways away. It's a little bit of a distance. Yeah. But like I say, Jadis is back trying to sell the whole thing about that echelon briefing. And, yep. And Rick has a place at the I've CRM. I've got grander plans for the CRM. Yeah. So they wind up having their little bit of a standoff. There yep. is a cutback to another sequence between Gabriel and Jadis. Mm-hmm. We're at the end of it. Jadis pulls a gun on Gabriel. Well, and at one point during this whole thing, Rick and Michonne get brought up and Jadis calls Michonne because I don't think at this point she knew her name. Mm-hmm. She just refers to Michonne as Rick's wife. Yeah. And, and Gabriel goes, what are you talking about? He goes, isn't the woman Rick is living with his wife and and even gabriel at this point is like well unofficially no yeah it's because like i say they've been exchanging a lot of information so jadis is getting like i say every time we see her in that sequence too with gabriel like she's buying more into the crm yep so it ultimately comes back to a standoff between rick michonne and, and jadis again well because and that's the thing we alluded to earlier in the pre in the recap Mm -hmm. was because Jadis was like, listen, you got to save me because she was injured and dying or presumably dying. She goes, listen, you got to save me because if I die, Alexandria and everyone, you know, is dead. Mm -hmm. If, if I get, and she's like covering her bases in, in contingency planning. If I get bitten, you know, everyone in Alexandria is dead. If I, if this happens, everyone, everyone in Alexandria is dead, this, that, and the other. And, and even Michonne is hesitant about doing anything because there was like four or five walkers coming up to her behind her at one point. She, uh, Jadis is discussing all this and Michonne takes out all the walkers because she's like, fuck, we have to like take her at her word right now. Mm-hmm. And that's the one thing too in this building too, because they're the ones that took out the recruits that Jadis brought in the, the yep. family of drifters there. Yep. So there's more zombies lurking. Yep. So, meanwhile, while they're trying to do this dramatic hide-and-seek, so to speak, mm-hmm. and then it gets to another standoff, yeah, you have another situation where Jadis 
is sitting there trying to pull the strings and zombies get involved. They get separated again. It comes to another standstill because she has a gun pointed at Rick. Michonne mm-hmm. comes out. She has her gun pointed at Jadis. They're having that like debate about who's doing what, X, Y, and Z. And then ultimately it comes across that while well, Jadis is giving her speech about why Rick, you know, the deal is going south. Rick needs to come back. Mm-hmm. Sure enough, zombies show up yep. and take out Jadis. Which I understand is supposed to be the big yeah moment, but I was like yeah, it's going like, yeah okay. But this drug on for like from point A to point B, the beginning of the episode. And now we're we're looking at about like forty five minutes, give or take. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it took its time to get there. Mm-hmm. So at this stage, it's almost like finally it's done. And Not- about the only th- interesting thing of note that I went ooh was when they first encountered the walkers in this area and the skin and they tried. Uh, uh, Michonne tried stabbing him with her her katana, couldn't because the skin was super hard because of like the gassers or the underground smoke or something like that with how the uh, the earth is up there and Yellowstone or like whatever it was. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. We haven't seen that before. So like they had to come up with a new way to kill him that wasn't just hey go for the head. Yeah. So it was interesting to see how the setup was, but yeah. as, as Jadis is dying, she now has a suddenly change of heart. Mm-hmm. Wants to die as her real name Anne. Yep. Where that's how she was introduced as, and yep. then she gives you the location of the dossier, which has been the end all be all. It's the holy grail here. Yep, it's it's all the information on Alexandria. Yep, so it's at Cassadica's uh, base, mm-hmm. and she is basically saying like, "Here, why don't you go do this?" And then she whips out a ring. Yep, and this is something that. Gabriel had originally found. I, I think Eugene might have made it, probably at some point. Because uh, remember, he was making bullets at one point, right? So it's this metal ring. Yep. And she gives it to Rick and says, "You know that you've been talking about this in your dreams. You've been like uh-huh. this is full on detail of what he's been doing at the CRM." Yep. Which I had many, many more questions about. That just like how detailed was Jadis watching him? Uh-huh. You know, like honestly, like to know what he's dreaming and knowing what he's saying, like all around. Like she really made a point to keep an eye on him. Yes, she did. So before she dies, like she gives him that and says, you know, why don't you go take care of it properly? This is what you've been wanting to do. And, you know, in turn, kill me as Anne because mm-hmm. I'm dying anyway because she's bleeding to death out of the zombie bite from her neck. So Rick does exactly that. There is a proposal yep. because it's the Walking Dead universe. Yep. And they ex- exchange vows. So in, in the eyes, I guess, of the Walking Dead universe, they are now husband and wife. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, well, we need to take out the CRM once and for all. Mm-hmm. We have to stop this entire army, just the two of us. Mm-hmm. So they wind up stealing said helicopter yep. and are on their way to the base to go get the dossier. Mm-hmm. But the show is not over here. Nope. Because we've now fast forward two years ago, one year ago. Now we're in present time. Yep. Gabriel shows up at the spot. Yep. Because even though he had the gun pulled on him, Jada shot the zombie that was coming after him instead and was like so conflicted about what she was doing. He's still sitting there waiting for their their yearly hookup. Mm-hmm. And it shows the time shift, and Gabriel is very upset because he now knows Jadis is dead. Well, I think he presumes. Well, you have to. If she didn't show up, it's yeah. like, it's like uh, what's yeah. the point? It, you know, for however long he waits, because obviously time moves differently in the Walking Dead universe. Yeah. So he winds up making a gravestone for her mm-hmm. before leaving, and that's literally how the show ends. Yep. So, like I say, acting-wise... It was okay. Michonne, Michonne and Jazz were great. Like yeah. I say, I'm I'm not criticizing this or putting any blame or any which way, shape, or form on uh, Pollyanna McIntosh. I thought Ooh. she was great with the material she had. Right. But I thought they just took so long to get to point A or point B. It was just like we're wasting time. Mm-hmm. And it's just like are we going to get this over with instead of like the building anticipation, which I think they right. completely missed the mark on. I no, I agree with you. Yeah. And, and trying to make Jad as sympathetic at this stage. Mm-hmm. Like, had they done this earlier, maybe it would have came off better. I'm not saying this episode, right? But like earlier in the show when she was on, right? Cause guess what? It, did not hit in my opinion. No, I agree 100% with you. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess final thoughts on this for you, Pad. Like I said, episode was fine. You know, it didn't necessarily break the banking, make me go, oh, my God, this was the best hour of television I've ever seen. 
But at the same token, though, it was like it didn't necessarily make me go, you know, that was awful. I needed I wish I could have done anything other than watch that and come and walk, come back and watched it, you know, some other point. It, it was fine. You know, it was it wasn't anything crazy. It, it was what it was. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, it was there. I'm yeah. not saying it was the worst episode they've ever no. done. By, by no stretch. They've they've done better, though. They've done a lot better. And I guess for how the show had been rolling, unfortunately, the bar was set a little high. Yeah. So I don't think they hit the mark here. Going into the finale, if you can call it that, there. I, I'm going to tell you right now, in my opinion, I don't think this is a finale. I think this is a season one finale. Could be. Which I'm not mad about, mind you. Noticeably, they have not done any Talking Dead stuff. For this entire show. Uh-huh. I would not be surprised if next week is the first week they do that. Oh, I fully bank on it. Absolutely. Because I, I was fully anticipating that after the first episode. And then I think it, I can't remember if it like re-aired the, the premiere again or it went into whatever movie they were showing. But like Talking Dead did not come on. Mm-hmm. And it has not come on for any of the previous episodes. No. I mean, the one saving grace, though, is the ratings have been steady. Yeah. So fans are invested in Especially it. with the uh, college basketball tournaments going on this weekend. Oh, yeah. So the fact they're still drawing in viewers at, at the level they are, it's still a win. Yeah. So I think that next week when we talk about the season finale, because that's how it's setting up, there's no way unless – I mean, there's, there's only one way I think this will be the series finale. Right. Somebody gets killed. Could be. One of the two gets killed. We know typically in the Walking Dead universe, uh, happy endings do not usually end well. Right. So the fact that they're... They're they're fleeting. The fact that they're raiding a military base. Yeah. Just the two of them. Just the two of them, and it's literally them against the world. Yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah. this, this this better have some payoff because I'm, I'm fearing this going into it. Yeah. But... Like I say, that's our opinions. Mm-hmm. We want to hear yours, ODPH Society. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH pod. What is your thoughts about The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, Episode 5, entitled Become? Did you watch it? Did you love it? Did you hate it? And why? Let's have that discussion. And what are your feelings going into the series slash season finale? I mean, where do you think we're going from here? Let's have that conversation, shall we? We're going to take a quick break first, though. We'll be right back. Do you like comic books? What about movies and TV shows? Well, we may be the show for you. We're Hops Geek News, a weekly podcast that discusses comics, movies, and TV shows while featuring a beer of the week. Every week we chat about what we messed up on the week before, and then we dive into what we're reading and watching, as well as some news. We then wrap it up with a geek-themed topic of the week. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts by searching Hops Geek News. Cheers. Cheers. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, and there is a lot going on at Disney Plus right now. Yeah, there is. Two big shows from them are really making an impact on Wednesday, but i got to be honest with you, Pat, and I know this goes against your Star Wars uh, fandom. Hey, listen, I don't fault it. X-Men 97 has been the talk of fans right now in pop culture. X-Men 97 is large enough that LeBron James himself heard about the show coming out and saying that this was that was his jam back of the day. He wanted to find out how to watch it, mm-hmm. and then he 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 apparently watched it at some point because then either like a couple days or like a day or so later, tweeted to the Disney Plus account wanting to know when the episodes dropped because he needed to see more. Mm-hmm. It's been a tremendous refresh re up from the original series, which debuted in 1992 on Fox and ended in 1997. Mm-hmm. Thus, X Men '97. So the series has really been a ratings win. Yeah. And viewership on Disney Plus has been setting some records with this. Oh, I believe it. So we definitely have a lot to talk about. First two episodes came out last week, and how they set up everything for this third one has been very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So that is what we're going to be breaking down is the latest adventures from the animated X-Men entitled Fire Made Flesh, episode three of X-Men 97. You know the deal by now, Pad. What is your spoiler-free statement? I thought the episode was really good. A little trippy, a little crazy. Wasn't as standard and kind of like a cookie cutter that the first two episodes were. Didn't follow the same format. I liked that. Kept me on the edge of my seat. Made me sit there and go, what the fuck is happening? And I didn't, don't mean that in a bad way. Genuinely couldn't figure it out. I'm like, what the shit? This is, this is crazy. And then just the way it played out, very excited to see where they go. For me, and I said this on uh, Turn a Page on Nerd Initiative <clears throat> YouTube. Because we just talked about the trial Magneto. Mm -hmm. I am somebody that has read the comics, like where they're basing a lot of this material on. Yep. So 
one thing I've been doing, and it's it's kind of a weird watch for me. Like I love the series, don't mm-hmm. get me wrong, mm-hmm. but I'm comparing what they're doing compared to the comics. Like sure, I, just the back and forth. I'm going like, okay, wait, this didn't happen. This is how they're doing. It. Okay, so I love the imagination they're running with this, mm-hmm. but they're merging like a couple different stories at once. But this is not like Batman Superman Do- um, <laughs> Doomsday. There, yeah, they're doing a really good job about like multitasking a lot right. of that late 80s, early 90s stories together. Right. Well, and that's the thing we have to remember with this show is unlike the comics where you can pull in any character you want, you can make it make sense with a simple line of text. Mm-hmm. This series, not so much because while I know they've said in the week uh, since the first two episodes came out, they haven't ruled out, you know, the animated Spider-Man making an appearance in this show. Mm hmm. They were in separate universes because if you remember back to the Spider-Man, the animated series that came out before this, this series did or after the series did around the same time, whatever it was. Yeah, it came out after uh, when Spider-Man needed like the greatest heroes to help him fight. And he, he pulled in Cap and he pulled in Ben Grimm and he pulled in all these others. They had to come from a separate dimension and that included Storm. So this, you know, that's the interesting thing they're doing with these stories because they can't do like the cops and go, oh, hey, you know what? We need somebody truth, righteous and, and, you know, waving a shield. Well, let's just bring in Cap for reasons. Let's Mm. let's have him appear. They don't have that luxury and they're making it work wonderfully. Yeah, no, they're definitely taking what they can and running with it. Yeah. And I love how they're doing the setup because, like I say, a lot of these stories are early or late 1980s. Yeah. And how they're doing it, making them feel... Vintage '90s uh-huh. is a testament to the creative side of things for the show. Yeah, so they've been doing an excellent job. This episode, if you're not familiar with a lot of the characters, especially the main protagonist in this one, mm-hmm. uh, or antagonist, I should say, this will throw you off a little bit. Well, he appeared in the original series. He did, but a bit. but more or less, who was the the big factor in this one? Oh, I got so you. So I say, I if you. you're not familiar with her story. It can throw you for a loop. And this goes into, I will say, with Marvel, the Summers family tree. Complicated. It is an understatement. Yes. <laughs> it is messy. Yeah. As all can be. So yeah. it will confuse you. However, though, I think for the most part, they nailed it on this. Mm-hmm. It They did do one of the more emotional moments in the comics on here. Yeah. Which really hit, and then where we left things off sets up another big story in the comics, too, which I am excited to see how they play it out because now there's a lot of things that are on the horizon with this, so Mm -hmm. I'm all in about this. So that said, phenomenal episode nevertheless, Pad, but let's get into that spoiler talk because I'm going to wind up slipping saying something soon. So in three, two, one talk to me this episode from the start hit the ground running kept me on the edge of my seat and kept me wondering what the hell was going to happen next you know so i i enjoyed it i thought everyone did a fantastic job the writing team you know the actors and actresses with the voice the story was awesome you know the visuals were absolutely nuts Mm -hmm. to say the least and to see where this could possibly go is interesting and i'm here for it this was a great episode yeah because it really did something which I think the comics had a problem with in the beginning. I mean, now it's an afterthought for the most part because of uh, what she's been involved in. And that is dealing with Madeline Pryor. Yeah. So if anybody is not familiar in the comics, Madeline Pryor is a clone of Mr. Sinister, uh, his creation. Mm-hmm. Because Mr. Sinister feels that the perfect mutant DNA is Scott Summers and Jean Grey. Mm-hmm. And it is this unhealthy obsession. Yeah. That he has. Yeah. So he he has always wanted the Summer's DNA, more importantly, uh, at his disposal. So thus he created the clone of Madeline Pryor. Madeline was sent to find Scott when Jean Grey was presumed dead. Obviously, things happen. They wind up having Nathan Summers. Mm -hmm. Jean Grey comes back. Complicated scenario. And then ultimately, though... Nathan is infected with a techno-organic virus. Mm-hmm. Has to go to the future by his, uh, 
I guess you could say half sister from an alternate dimension, Rachel Summers, who is yeah. Mother Azaski. Yeah. Uh, like Ascani there. Like it's it's just it's complicated. It, yeah, to say the least. So they, they simplified it a little bit with us. They very much simplified it, which I liked. Yeah. Except I didn't think that they explained the the techno organic virus that well. I think they did as much as they could for let's not forget the 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 targeted age of this show is obviously kids, but they know that when you break down the demographics, there's going to be a sizable percentage that is over the age of say 25. Uh so did they explain it in the full depth you would expect them to? No. But when it comes to you know dealing with kids and not having to necessarily go into like full blown like science talk and science lingo that they may not understand. I think they kept it pretty simple. It's just like, Hey, he's infected with a virus. We can't do anything about it here. Um, you know, we got to go into the future. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with you too. It's just because like of, of how that ties in with cable and his origin. Sure. sure. Because obviously Nathan Summers is cable. Yeah. And his, his reason for being is apocalypse. Like I say, they, they took some liberties here, mm-hmm. which I'm waiting to see how it plays out. Oh, of course. But there was just one thing that really stuck out to me because as this episode kicks off is right where we left off with uh, the Mutant Liberation Begins episode. A couple minutes, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes yep. after. A Jean Grey shows up at the front door of the X-Men. Clone Jean, I think is what they called her, a Jean clone. Right. Something like that. So Beast is sitting there and trying to figure out everything, and he says, no, this is the real Jean Grey. Because what, what is it? He did some carbon dating or some science-y mumbo-jumbo. I, I heard it. I understood it, but I forget what it is in the moment. But like he met, he measured both of their carbon dates, and and essentially like they're the same age, but one's slightly older or whatever it is so like he figured out that the one they've been dealing with you know for lord knows how long but since the start of this show is a clone Mm -hmm. so it turns into this very like who is the real gene gray they start arguing a little bit we do see a shot of the gene clone as we find out going to check on her son because yeah she's uh then they lead into this because they uh the clone starts scanning real Jean's mind. And mm-hmm. she starts seeing some glimpses of what happened to real Jean. And then they figure out the like, oh yeah, she's a clone. And she's and, her, and even she's like, oh no, I'm not. Like Storm she even pulls out the card. Storm would believe me. Yeah. And and she looks at Scott and she goes, Scott, you believe I'm the real Jean, don't you? And even Scott's like, oh man, I don't know. Yeah, he's like, I don't know what to do here. I, I am lost. So when she goes into the room to check on her son, Mm -hmm. over the voice of the baby monitor comes Mr. Sinister. Creepy as all fuck. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my God. I mean, this is him to a nutshell. Yep. Like I say, it's him to a T. Yep, yep, yep. Like, so he is basically saying, like, you know, you're the real clone. (laughs) Hi, I've been waiting for you. Yeah, now it's finally time to reveal yourself. And she's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. You work for me. Mm -hmm. And then he winds up activating... Gene's powers, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And I love how they did this, and I wish they kept this on until the very end, though. Okay. You saw the diamond shape that we always see yeah. Mr. Sinister for it. It came out of Madeline Pryor, and it was right. on her as she was the Goblin Queen. Yep. I thought they should have kept that with mm-hmm. right until she walks away. Hmm. But I understand why they didn't. But we do see her show up in her Goblin Queen outfit. Yep. Now, this is a this is a throwback to a different crossover they did because when Jean or when Malin Pryor started emerging as a supervillain, she was part of a crossover called Inferno, mm-hmm. and this deals with demons going to limbo. It's it was a very big '80s crossover for the mutants, right? So I love how they threw it back here, and this kind of explains why she took the name of the Goblin Queen and and went there. They didn't really explain a lot of that per se on the episode. Mm-hmm. At least in my opinion, I don't know about you, Pat. No, I don't think they explained it all that much, but I went along with it for the ride. Right. So, like, that's where you go with for her history for this. So, like, she- like I understood it with the transformation thing because, like, she showed up, like, she's talking to, uh, she's talking to Mister Sinister. Beast is being Beast and not giving up, like, figuring out what the fuck is going on and how she was cloned. And then he sees what he calls, you know, every every clone or every scientist likes to leave their their own signature and i've just found 
uh, hers or the, the one on her. And, and, and I love the wordplay he did because he goes, and frankly, it's just sinister. Mm-hmm. And they figure out, fuck, it's Mr. Sinister. Yeah. So they go running off to her. All the meanwhile, uh, Sinister is like selling her a line and she buys in real quick. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know about you, but that, that was the one thing to me where she's like, it wasn't super long. And I get this is only this was only like a half hour episode, but she bought into that real quick. Well, the one thing you got to remember, too, is Sinister had that mind control going on. That's true. So her will to fight back was not exactly the same one that she would have against anybody else. Like True. she has that diamond in her head. True. You know, she's she has mind control. So mm-hmm. it's so this is a situation that it was really out of her hands. And right. they really tried making her a sympathetic villain here, which I actually liked this take. But as she's going through the expansion, she winds up unleashing these nightmare scenarios mm-hmm. on everyone in her path. Yep. Like they did an homage to the ring with Sunspot and Jubilee. Good Lord. That where you see creepy. that. Yeah, the monster coming out of the TV. Yeah. You see Gambit, who. <laughs> let's talk about this for a minute, too. Hey. Who uh, is already suspicious. Yeah. Because what is it? It's him, Morph, and who was the third person? There was somebody Bishop? else with them. Might have been Bishop coming out of the danger room. Yeah. And they're like, oh, let's see who's got the danger room next. And it's Magneto and Rogue. And now after last episode where he saw Magneto, or not Magneto, he saw Rogue coming out of, well, I guess it's Magneto's office now. Mm -hmm. He's suspicious AF of what's going on between those two. And now they're spending a ton of time together. And Morph, uh, you know, in his comedic role, explains it away, going like, oh, hey, she's just trying to really show the new boss, you know, her stuff and really make an impression. May, uh, uh, Gambit's not buying it though, and and he's like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna go talk to her, mm-hmm. and he goes to find them, and he, I forget if he, I couldn't honestly tell what room he went into, but he goes into a room, and he sees them in a loving embrace, but you can tell it's not them because they altered the voices a little bit in post production, uh, and the and the bodies start morphing together like they're a tree or something. I had to really chuckle at this. Yeah, and this is one I knew. I know you won't know about, but if, like, say, if you have read a lot of X Men comics, you know the scene. Did you understand what that their embrace was? No, is from the time that Rogue and Magneto were in the Savage Land. Ah, and okay. that's when they were actually a couple. Gotcha. So it it played into that. I'm going, oh, all right, this is interesting. And all the meanwhile, this is going on. The other uh, X Men are dealing with their own traumas mm-hmm. and their own hellscapes. They can't fit. They know because Beast said, oh, it's sinister. Uh, they're like, how the hell is he exerting this much power over the over the mansion from that great a distance? Because their alarms would have gone off if he was in the perimeter if, or if he was nearby. They're not going off. So they know he's not there. They're like, how the hell is he doing this? Yeah. And somebody comes up with it's not sinister. And then clone gene or sorry, goblin queen comes in the room and goes, hi, it's me. Yeah. So she winds up making an escape with the son. Mm-hmm. And obviously Scott and company are like fully convinced, like, we have to go get him. Yep. So they wind up having Morph, of all people, lead them to uh, Sinister's Laboratory. Yep. Now, obviously, this ties back into the first season mm-hmm. of this show because Morph was kidnapped by Sinister when they yep. all thought he was presumed dead. And he does turn back into that human form. Yeah, he does. So I love how they did that throwback for it. Yep. So you do see there is a assault on Sinister's laboratory. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, back at the X Mansion, you have Beast is trying to help Jean Grey along with Wolverine. Along with Wolverine, he who stayed behind because hey, he's got feelings for Jean. Yep, I mean one of the longest running triangle love triangles in comics. Messy one too. Yep. So you see that he's staying right by her side as this is all going down. You do see this assault on the laboratory once they get inside. The Goblin Queen is waiting for them. Yep. Knew, knew and predicted them to a T what would happen. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, you do see that Nathan, the baby, is put into a chamber. Mm-hmm. And Sinister is giving his selling point about what he is going to do. Yep. And he has this vision of making him pretty much the perfect mutant. Yep. And this has been his, like, Sinister's dream with the summer's DNA. Mm-hmm. So he winds up immersing him in this green liquid. Going to make him invulnerable. Mm-hmm. And you see that 
this is now a race against time right. to get him freed. Right, because this is going on. You, like you mentioned, they're, uh, Beast and Wolverine are trying to help Jean because she's in such a state she can barely control her powers at mm. the moment. And and Wolverine's like, listen, just remember who you are. Focus on my voice. You know, remember my memories or whatever it is he has her do. Mm. And she slowly starts to come to like, like uh, Logan? Yeah, no, Jean, it's me. Like, and she slowly starts to piece everything back together and come back to the gene we know. Because mm-hmm. they wind up having Gene taken on Madeline on the astral plane. Well, yeah, because Gene senses what's going on in this laboratory because the Goblin Queen is is honestly whooping their ass. Mm-hmm. And even goes up to uh, Morph transforms into... I forget who he trained. I recognized it, but I forget. He transformed into magic. That's what it was. He transforms into magic. Magic starts. So magic starts fighting the Goblin Queen. But then Goblin Queen goes, oh, no, you're going to fight for me. Taps him on the head. And, and you just uh, morph turns back into morph from uh, magic. Mm-hmm. And, and But in the magic voice goes, yes, my queen. Mm-hmm transforms back into magic because reasons and then starts fighting the x-men all the meanwhile the eyes are green the magic uh character though that's an easter egg oh okay because magic is heavily tied in with limbo gotcha. and during that storyline gotcha so. so this is all going on gene is finally coming too and then because of her connection closeness with cyclops figures out shit they're under attack i need to go mm-hmm. and then because let's not forget folks she uh, you might they might not have fully you know Explain the situation in prior uh, the prior show with this. Let's not forget, Jean Grey is an Omega level. Yeah. She shows up and goes, hi, we need to have a talk. Yeah. So once that confrontation happens, and like I said, we already saw that great throwdown they had on the Astro plane. Like, here is, like, another one where Jean's powers overwhelm. Mm-hmm. And Madeline Pryor snaps back to reality. Mm-hmm. All and, the meanwhile, they're trying to sort through their very convoluted and very mixed up memories. Right. I mean, at, but at this point, too, this is where you see the diamond fall out of yep. Malin Pryor's head. So now you can definitely tell she's freed. Yep. They make the run in to the laboratory. Mm-hmm. Cyclops has the only abilities to hurt Mr. Sinister. Yep. So he's blasting him with beams and they wind up hitting the tube mm-hmm. with Nathan inside it to free him. And mm-hmm. Sinister is screaming like, you don't know, you just killed him. Mm-hmm. So they wind up making the escape, stopping Sinister, albeit, though, Sinister was right mm-hmm. because Nathan is now getting covered in this techno organic virus. Yep. So this is a situation that they're like trying to figure out how to save him. Mm-hmm. And it comes down to Bishop has to take him to the future. Cause the one thing that was a mil- uh, mentioned early in the episode was while beast is trying to figure out what the hell's going on with clone gene, he was still working on Bishop's transporter time travel thing. Mm-hmm. And that uh, and they fit because, listen, the technology they have in this present time isn't as advanced or capable as it is in future time of fixing this thing. All it can do is take two people and, and it's decided that it has to be Bishop and uh, Nathan, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the summer's kid. Yeah. Which devastates the fuck out of Scott because he says, I didn't want to be like my father and abandon my son. Mm-hmm. No, no, it's a powerful scene because. Yeah. Obviously, and this this is what really held up with the comic, too. Yeah. Because when they have to give up their son because of, well, Apocalypse infects him. Right. It's a heartbreaking moment. Mm-hmm. And it's one that you, it'll hit you on that emotional level. So as you've seen the grief just pour out of Scott yeah. and Gene, like, you know, they're like... Like, where do you go on from this? And yeah. You, and you have to accept what happens. Well, and even the touching one-on-one moment. Uh, Jean has with Nathan, mm-hmm. where she's like, listen, just remember that every day we thought about you and missed you. Yeah, because it kind of ties back into something in the comics, too, because when Cable does eventually reveal himself to be mm-hmm. the son, mm-hmm. uh, it's not a warm and fuzzy moment. Yeah. Um, when it comes out, like if you ever want to go do a deep dive and maybe one day we'll do this for, uh, I don't know, Patreon or, or turn a page. The Executioner song, right? This it, it explained everything here, and you didn't they already have this out in the prior show though? 
I feel like they might they must have. They might have. I might because I because I know Cable showed up in the original series when I got done watching Bad Batch. The preview thing, like they, you know how you know how they suggest yeah. the show. Uh, the original X Men series came up and Cable was there. So I'm I'm betting they they've explained this already, which makes it all the more confusing. Yeah, which like I say, it, well I don't know if he's revealed his identity mm, on maybe. on the show. Like let's say hashtag ODPH Pod. It's been a while since I've I've done a full five season rewatch of. X Men, uh, the animated series, but if that's in there, we'll definitely clear it up because that's the only way it, just, it, it made sense to me. Because Scott, like, if they knew that he was going to turn out to be Cable, right? They would have done things differently, right? So that's why I say I don't think they did that here. Yeah. But it still pans out for like an emotional scene as you see Bishop take him to the future. Yep, which is even crazier knowing their history together. Yep. Um, but still, I mean, it plays out to be a strong moment, and Jean has a parting goodbye to with her clone who literally says, I'm going to go find my own life. I haven't had one. I'm going to forge my own path. Because the, the the issue between clone Gene or Madeline now and Gene is they don't know when the switch happened. Mm-hmm. That, so they don't know who has the... Fe- How frightening is this? They don't know who has the Phoenix powers. Right. Christ. And they don't know wh- whose memories start when and whose memories end where. Yeah. So it's, it's all messy. It's all messy, but Madeline Pryor winds up leaving. Mm-hmm. to go somewhere for now, mm-hmm. but I'm sure we'll see her down the road at some point. Yep. And then we get a little update about what's going on with the one only Storm. Yeah. Because she's watching events unfold with Magneto mm-hmm. from a bar, and mm-hmm. uh, sure enough, mm-hmm. she gets approached by somebody. Yeah. Who is that, Pat? Uh, that is a dude named Forge who tells her, hey, I can uh, help you get back what you lost. Yeah. And that's how the show ends. Mm-hmm. So a lot happens in this episode. They did juggle around a lot of Easter eggs, like a, like a touch upon. Like, so if you haven't read Inferno, you might want to check that out if you got the time on Marvel Unlimited or at your comic shops to go dig through. I mean, it is a pretty sizable crossover. If memory serves me right. Right. It's been a while since I've read it, but you deal with demons, limbo. It's it's a crazy thing. Madeline Pryor is a big part of that. And then to also tie into the Executioner song, if you haven't read that, that is a 16-part crossover, though. Gotcha. So if you got the time, it's well worth it. Uh, especially the ending. The ending, I think, is one of the best endings for a uh, crossover in recent memory. But this had a lot going on, set up the stage for some very interesting moments. I think next week's episode, though, is entitled Life, Death, Part 1. Mm-hmm. So that will be a very storm-centric episode, which I'm here for. So to kind of take the break for right now, I think they ended things on a high note. A very, very good episode. Pat, final thoughts? No, it was a very good episode. Super interested to see where things go. And yet again, I wish all of the episodes were out because I would binge the hell out of the show. Yeah, same here. I mean, they have not faltered yet. Third episode is very, very strong. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag OdiePagePod. What is your thoughts about Fire Made Flesh, episode three of X-Men 97, currently airing on Disney Plus? Let's talk about it, shall we? We're going to take a quick break, though. We'll be right back. You ever wondered what comics Mark from Vale Mai is into? What Zach from Left Behind's favorite MCU movies are? Well, Metalcore Nerds is the show for you. My name is Sean Mott, and here at Metalcore Nerds, we cover the latest things in pop culture, whether it be Star Wars, Marvel, DC, AEW, and everything else in between. You can listen to the show every Monday on Adobe Howl at 7 p.m. Eastern, or find it anywhere you find podcasts after it debuts on the radio station. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. And like we touched upon, Disney Plus doing big things right now. Busy busy uh, space on a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Because X-Men 97 has been doing great things and also has Star Wars The Bad Batch. Hell yeah. So this one is definitely picking up a lot of steam as it's heading into its final season. And it's on the back end right now. Yeah. So, Pat, how you how are you feeling about that right now? Uh, the fact, I mean, the fact that we're on the back half that presumably, and of course, nothing is ever set in stone. We never really know until, you know, we hit a point where it's presumably you're done. Uh, it's it's kind of bittersweet just because we, we first lived with and grew up with these clones Way back when the uh, film came out, and what was it like, two thousand eight, two thousand ten, mm-hmm. something, something like that. You know, I'm not talking the micro series. I'm talking the three D Dave Filoni features. So, I mean, we're we're coming up on over almost twenty years of, of these characters. You know, fifteen, twenty years, whatever it is. You know, so the fact that we're winding down, you know, presumably they're not, we're not going to be seeing any more stories with them set in this time period. You know, it's 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 bittersweet. It's sad to see, but hey, they're getting one hell of a send off though. This is very true, and the latest episode definitely is keeping up to speed with that. So you know how we do it by now. 
Pad, what is your spoiler-free statement about today's episode, episode nine, entitled The Harbinger? Wasn't a whole lot plot-wise going on with this episode, but it sure as shit didn't answer any questions. It, it in fact, kind of added some layers to those questions. Uh, good episode. You know, it wasn't well, much like I said with the Walking Dead episode. It wasn't the greatest thing ever. It wasn't the worst thing ever. I enjoyed it, though. You know, anytime I get to see uh, Star Wars in animation form, I'm a very happy individual. Uh, but I enjoyed it. It was a plot builder. Yeah. That's all it was. Yeah. I mean, and that's not a bad thing. No. But it wasn't one that really moved the needle either. Like, it was one that they're setting up for a lot of things. And with only six episodes left, Mm -hmm. I think they really want to build for a monster finale. So that's what really this whole episode was about. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. But... I uh, definitely introduced a new character into the Bad Batch there that uh, I think a lot of fans were excited to see. Reintroduced and added, again, added more questions than we had answers. Yeah. So let's get into it and uh, really break it down. So in three, two, one, Pad, talk to me. Like you said, this was a, this was a plot building uh, episode. It added more questions than we had answers to it. It really didn't answer any questions, but it made me all the more intrigued to see where things go because we are building to something big, I feel, with the end. Uh, you know, Project Necromancer is involved. We are dealing with many chlorines and we are dealing with force users. Uh, so anytime you get those mixtures together, it's one hell of a cocktail and I am here for it. I agree. I mean, like I say, this was just plot building, mm-hmm. but seeing Ventress show up. Yeah. Surprised, uh, to say the least, because <laughs> there was a book that came out, uh, and I pulled it up here, courtesy of the folks over at the Star Wars Wiki. Uh, there was a book by Christy Golden, good book by the way. I highly recommend you check this out. Uh, check out your local library or your local uh, bookstore. Uh, written by Christy Golden. This came out. Uh, let's see, hardcover. It came out July seventh, twenty fifteen. Paperback. It came out March first, twenty sixteen. Uh, where essentially it was based on a. It, it was an unused. Uh, script, story, whatever you will, from that was supposed to be in the Clone Wars TV series, but of course Clone Wars was canceled, then brought back, and then canceled again, and then brought back again. Clone Wars is done, done, not coming back, but this was going to be part of an eight-part story arc between Asaj, Asaj Ventress and the Jedi... Uh, sometimes a dark Jedi, whatever you want to call it, Quinlan Voss. Mm. You know, in, in, in that book, it was presumed that she died. You know, the the, the ending kind of, if you read it, kind of leaves it vague, but most fans were going, okay, maybe she's, she's dead. You know, and also going based off the fact that to that point, you know, Rebels, which takes place after Clone Wars, dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, original trilogy, don't see her, so dead. Uh, and even into, the, you know, the, the sequel trilogy and Resistance and even what we had seen to this point in, in The Bad Batch, which takes place before Rebels. Mm-hmm. Don't see her, so presumably dead. Yeah. So then we get to this point, and admittedly, I forgot she showed up in the trailer uh, before the season dropped. Whoops. Uh, but so the fact that she was presumed dead for the last, you know, seven, eight years, whatever it is, and hey, surprise, she ain't dead. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Yeah, I was very shocked to see her show up on the screen because, like I say, the batch has been hiding out, obviously, knowing that Omega has now a very big uh, bullseye on her. Yeah, she's got a real big target. Mm -hmm. So they're hiding out on Pabu. Mm -hmm. And while they're there, well, they come across Ventress herself. Well, Ventress comes across them. Yeah, so obviously knowing what Omega is capable of, Mm -hmm. there is, like we touched upon, there's a lot of people looking for her. Well, and they in the batch, you know, goes, who the hell are you and what are you doing here? Mm. And she goes, well, hey, listen, you know, you kind of kicked up a hornet's nest because you start asking around about M count and M count contracts. You're going to attract some unwanted attention. Yeah. How did you find us? Well, uh, I'm uh, Fennec sent me and she and the batch goes, we didn't tell Fennec where we were. And she goes, oh, don't worry. You were you were fairly easy to find. Yeah. So. Ventress shows up and really breaks down to the batch about the whole M count. Well, and and the batch is trying to explain why they're asking without giving her a direct reason. They mm. try they try saying, "Well, we've got this friend who you know the Empire is looking for her, and we've rescued her a couple times. And and when we've rescued her, we've heard mention that they want her for her M count, and we we just have no idea what this M count is. Why are, why are they looking for our friend? Yeah, never mind the fact that their friend is." Well, Omega herself. Mm-hmm. So it is an interesting play that happens here. But then Omega is very interested to talk with Ventress. Mm-hmm. That 
is about, okay, well, what can I do here? Since obviously if uh, my M count is high enough and then there's something involving the force, yeah, you might be able to help out a little bit. Well, yeah, because Ventress does explain to them like, hey, okay, so M count is basically the, the way that you measure a person's ability to use the force. Mm-hmm. The stronger it is, the more likely you are. She goes, everybody's got it. Yep. Varying degrees, but it... You know, the stronger you are, the more you can use the force. And and typically, higher users are, are say, you know, Jedi or or others. Mm. Uh, And she goes, and and Omega wants to know if there's a way to test this. Because she'll always say, oh, I could could be a Jedi. I could be, you know, I could be a force user. I want to find out if I am. And Ventress goes, well, there is a way, but, you know, I don't really want to do it. And, And Omega basically begs her. And she goes, all right, fine. Well, you know, we'll work on this. Yeah. So they start working there, but obviously the batch is not exactly too happy about this. Yeah, they're they're understandably concerned because they thought they were all hunky dory, hidden from everybody, and here shows up a bounty hunter on their doorstep, uh, unannounced. Mm-hmm. And especially with how Omega is gravitating towards her as well. Mm-hmm. Like I say, Ventress is you know really connecting and trying to help out best she can, but obviously yeah. there's there's hidden meanings happening here. Yeah. So. During one of these moments, though, Ventress decides to go out to sea mm-hmm. because there's been some tests done, but this is where it's the final contest. Mm-hmm. So they get out there and wind up actually drawing the attention of a giant sea monster. This is after, but also, uh, I think it was Crosshair dug into some records. And because they, they, they're all having that moment where, like, they, you see somebody in a crowd and they go, that person looks really familiar. Who the hell are they? And they figure out who she is, and they figure out she's a size Ventress, you know, the the Confederacy, the the Separatists assassin. Mm -hmm. And they trust her even less now because she killed some of their brothers. Yeah. But like you said, they go out to sea, they start testing her, and this this monster shows up. And they get out there like, oh, my God, they need help. And and they fly the ship out there. But Ventress then goes, leave. You're not helping. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she, they wind up having to really have some trust in her. Yep. Ventress winds up, you know, taking the creature down peacefully. Mm-hmm. So thus, when this happens, the batch is a little more pro to hear what she has to say. Because the thing you got to remember with Ventress is, in, in case you haven't seen Clone Wars in a while, while yes, Ventress for a majority of the Clone Wars was a villain, was a part of Dooku, was did learn under Dooku, you know, an unofficial apprentice, you know. She did start out her training as a Jedi, Mm -hmm. you know, so she does have, well, you know, if you're talking percentages, she's got more of a percentage in dark side training. There is still some there from the light side. Right. So it's one of those situations where they're still at an uneasy standby. Yeah. But before Ventress takes off, though, she says something, Pat, I don't know if she was on the up and up. I wouldn't trust this any further than I can throw it. Mm -hmm. Because she tries saying, well... You don't really have to worry so much per se. Because... Well, well, first Omega asks yeah. because she's like, well, you f-, she asks about the tests and she's like, well, you failed the first test spectacularly. And and, and then she goes, well, and Omega goes, well, yeah, but I, I passed on the second test. And then they get to the third one and, and Ventress tells Omega that, you know, hey, listen, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, you've got some there, but it's not even necessarily anything to worry about like the Empire shouldn't be that in, interested in you about mm-hmm. it. And she goes, oh, that's a bummer, but uh, what are you going to do? Yeah. So Omega goes off, and then she plays it to the Bad Batch, you know, the the clones, the opposite way that, like, hey, she and, and she doesn't say it, but she implies Omega's got a high M count. Yeah. And that, like, hey, listen, the, the Empire is going to come for her, and it was easy for me to find you. It's not going to be hard for somebody else to find you here, too. Yeah. So once they're tipped off about that, they have to make a decision, and literally that's how the episode ends. Yep. So overall, like I say, this did enough yeah. to, to plant some seeds for the story, but I don't think it's a game changer by any no. stretch. You know, like I think. No, they, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I think they they told a solid story, more of a one off, but it's really just trying to say about emphasizing the hunt for Omega, mm-hmm. and just there's something very special about her. What is it? And this is really going to build into that season finale. And also, Asaz Ventress is still alive, and that's exciting. Yes, that is very exciting. So however she's going to play into this, I don't think this is the last time we've seen her here. Probably not. No, I, I think it's very well timed. She's obviously. very resourceful. Yeah, so I think we'll see her sooner than later. But, I mean, overall, Pat, final thoughts on it? Well, a good episode. You know, it wasn't a whole ton going on action-wise or plot-wise, but you know what? There was enough there that, that I liked it. 
I agree with you. I mean, like I say, there wasn't a lot per se, but it definitely didn't feel like filler. It just felt like plot building. And you know what? With the powers of be involved with the show, that's never a bad thing. Nope. So that all said, hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPagePod. What is your thoughts about Star Wars, The Bad Batch, Episode 9 entitled The Harbinger? Did you love it? Did you hate it or why? And let's talk about it. And what do you think the show is going with only six episodes left? It's scary to think that's really coming I up. I know. Because it's, crazy. it's coming out May 1st, right before. May the 4th be with you. May the 4th week. So definitely make sure you're checking that out on Disney+. Plus. Hit us up. Let us know. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Scott Snyder, and you better listen to the ODPH podcast, or I'm coming for you, and Batman is coming for you. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. Pad, what you got? Got a couple things to talk about. Uh, the first of which is a new Marvel game coming out that was announced today as we record. Uh, and that is, the game is titled Marvel Rivals. Ooh. Uh, and reading from the article on Marvel.com, it says, quote, NetEase Games and Marvel Games are excited to announce their latest collaboration, Marvel Rivals, a cooperative superhero ba- team-based PvP shooter. Players can assemble an ever-evolving all-star squad of superheroes and supervillains while battling with unique superpowers across a dynamic lineup of destructible maps from across the Marvel multiverse. Marvel Rivals is in development for PC by a NetEase team composed of global talent who previously worked on hit franchises such as Call of Duty and Battlefield. Quote, We are overjoyed to bring Marvel Rivals to players around the world. We have always loved Marvel's universe and its characters, and we are so excited to be developing this game, said the Marvel Rivals producer Stephen Wu. This is the game we want to make, and we feel very lucky to have to be the team who made all of this come true. Close quote. NetEase is excited to collaborate with Marvel Games to deliver a thrilling, fast-paced cooperative gameplay experience featuring all of your favorite Marvel superheroes, said Ethan Wang, Senior Vice President uh, of NetEase, Inc., Uh, This partnership with Marvel Games continues our commitment to build world-class development teams and reach global audiences with cutting-edge experiences, Uh, close quote. And then from uh, Jay Ong, the head of Marvel Games, he said, quote, Marvel Rivals is one of our most ambitious game development projects. Since the conceptualization of the game and throughout our collaboration, our Marvel team has poured our hearts and souls into this project, and we are thrilled to work with the incredible team at NetEase Games to help deliver the ultimate superhero team-based PvP shooter. Close quote. Uh, so, the ro- the roster we know of as uh, as of current recording is, uh, you've got, uh, I'm reading from the list, uh, courtesy of the folks over at IGN, you have got uh, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Groot, Hulk, Iron Man, Loki, Luna Snow, Magic, Magneto, Mantis, Namor, Penny Parker, Rocket Raccoon, Scarlet Witch, Spider-Man, Storm, Star-Lord, and the Punisher. And it should be noted, uh, voicing Spider-Man is Yuri Lowenthal from the Spider-Man hmm. PlayStation games. Uh, but if you're not familiar with what this game is going to be, uh, if you've ever played or seen Overwatch, that's what it looks like. It looks like an Overwatch game, but Marvel version. Uh should be interesting. Right now, it's only PC, it looks like, because it's going to be out on the Steam and Epic Game Store. Uh, but we will see. I'm, I'm going to guess it's going to come to uh, consoles at some point. Uh, they just got to get it going on PC first. The only thing that is concerned to me, it's free to play. Which, hey, that's not a bad thing because you don't have to spend $60, $70 to play it. But what that does usually mean is on the back end. Usually a lot of microtransactions. Yeah, I was going to say buy buy a lot of DLCs. Well, skins, microtransactions, pay to win, that type of thing. Uh, Would not be surprised if once this gets rolling, because uh, we do know, Curtis, uh, from the trailer they released, uh, that the closed alpha begins in May. Would not be surprised, you know, because obviously if you've played Overwatch, there are skins with the characters in that game. And, hey, it's a Marvel project that is, you know, Marvel spanning all its many decades and with the films and whatnot. Would not be surprised if with some of these characters, you know, you're able to pick up and say an inf- uh, Infinity War Iron Man costume or say, you know, an old man Logan uh, uh, Hulk skin, mm-hmm. so so to speak. But the thing is, is you ain't going to get 
free. Yeah. It's going to cost you some money. We'll see what happens. But nonetheless, it looks interesting. Looks very interesting. Lineup yeah. looks very, very interesting. Yeah. Surprised. I was surprised to see the Punisher. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, hey, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, then we got a couple trailers that came out, the first of which was for the folks over at HBO Max and DC. Uh, that is the next chapter in Matt Reeves' Batman universe. Mm-hmm. And that is the trailer for The Penguin, of course, starring Colin Farrell, which drops this fall. Listen, I don't need to be sold much on this on this whole universe. This universe is one of the most dynamic Batman universes we've ever seen because, as we said when we reviewed the movie when it came out, it put the detective back in Batman yep. that we have not seen on screen since maybe the Batman the Animated Series uh, times. Uh, but, hey, any chance to delve into this universe again, I am all for. I'm all here for it. It reminds me a little bit of the current con- – um Tom King series. Oh, yeah. A little, little bit. A little, so. little bit. little bit. Uh, then we got another trailer from the folks over at HBO Max and, uh, well, HBO. Uh, it is the season two trailer for House of the Dragon, which is dropping June 16th. Got to admit, I should probably do a rewatch on this because I don't remember much from season one. No, I agree. Nothing against the show, and I'm not saying season one was bad. Mm-hmm. Season one came out like, what, 2020, 2021? 2021. So it, it's, it's, it's been, been a, three years? I believe so. Lots come out, and I've watched a lot of things since then. It might be 2022. Like, to be honest with you, it feels like forever, though. Yeah, it, it's been a while. So, But season two trailer looks incredible. Looks yeah. nuts. Uh, there is one point in the trailer where it, it appears now, obviously, trailers can be a little misdirecting. But it appears that there are a couple individuals who are fleeing for one of the dragons into a forest. Mm-hmm. That might be one of the dumbest decisions I've seen in entertainment in quite some time. I'm here for it, though. Uh, but no, we'll see what happens. No, it looked good, though. It looked very, very good. Lastly, certainly not leastly, uh, dropping today on the PlayStation Store is the PlayStation Summer Sale. Uh, there are some fantastic deals in RIP to everyone's wallet if you have a PlayStation. I'm not going to go through them all because uh, I'm sitting on the PlayStation store right now. There's almost 3,700 yeah, items on yeah, sale. Yeah, yeah. couple of interesting ones, a couple of bestsellers you might want to keep your eye out for if you're an NBA fan. Uh, the NBA 2K24 Black Mamba Edition. Okay. Uh, that is a super special edition. Normally retails $99.99. 75% off. It's $24.99. Can't beat that. Red Dead Redemption 2, one of the best games I've ever played. Uh, normally uh, on the PlayStation Store, $59.99, you can get it for 67% off. Okay. $19.79. Hogwarts Legacy, <clears throat> uh, you got the PS5 version. One of the better Harry Potter games, and that's really saying something. Uh, but normally you can get it for $69.99. 50% off. It's only 35 bucks. Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut, which is the game plus all of the DLC. Uh, normally sixty nine ninety nine, fifty eight percent off. You can get it for twenty nine thirty nine. If seriously, if you have if you have a PlayStation, and it's on the PlayStation Four as well. Yeah. If you have not played that game, holy fuck, that game's amazing. Uh, Red Dead Redemption. This is the re release they did, uh, which includes the Red Dead Redemption plus Undead Nightmare, one of the best DLCs of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, normally forty nine ninety nine uh, on sale for twenty percent off. It is uh, thirty nine ninety nine. Dang. Uh, Spider Man, uh, the original Spider Man. PlayStation game uh, remastered. Normally forty nine ninety nine, you can get it for fifty percent off. So mm-hmm. definitely a lot of good deals going on over at the PlayStation Store. If you got a PS four or PS five, definitely check those out. Absolutely, yeah. And then obviously it's Wednesday, so yes. we, we got to give you some comic picks. Pad, what you picking up this week? Obviously, uh, Ultimate Spider Man issue number three is out. From, oh, from so good. Jonathan Hickman a description of this: Peter Parker's new life gets even more complicated. Spider Man sizes up the new hero, Green Goblin. Uh, as they tr- as they team up to fight a new supervillain, secrets about the corporations running North America are revealed, and you'll never guess who discovers Spider Man's secret identity. The series has been so good. Uh huh. It's it's incredible. This is this will make you a Spider Man fan if you've been a little jaded lately. Uh, and then you've got also from the folks over at Marvel X Men ninety seven issue number one from Steve Fox. Salvador Espin is the artist. This one reads the official prelude to the hotly anticipated Disney Plus show. The X Men are back, and the nineties have never looked better. In this official prelude to the upcoming X Men ninety seven, created in collaboration with the showrunners, discover what Storm. Jubilee, Wolverine, and the rest of the beloved 90s X-Men cast have been up to in the time before their return. Startling startling revelations here lead directly into the hotly anticipated new series. Don't miss out. Cannot wait to read this, although I do got to wonder. 
Uh, why is it coming out after the second week the show's on and not before the show came out? I don't know. Well, I think obviously you want to, your main driver there is the show. Sure. So this is just more like a, a cherry on the Sunday, so to speak. That's true. Uh, then you've got Amazing Spider-Man issue number 46 from Zeb Wells. Uh, this one reads, Spidey is cleaning up the mess that is his life after some of the most harrowing conflicts of his life. Uh, side note, boy, that feels like this, you're describing his entire existence. Yeah, that's <laughs> That's his entire. That's a bold statement. That's his entire existence. Christ. Uh, But the description goes on. Electro isn't going to wait for Spidey to figure his problems out, though. A dangling thread from earlier in the run that you forgot was dangling starts to pull the sweater apart. Close quote. I'm very curious your thoughts on this, Pat. Okay. I've read it. I'm not going to give anything away. I'm not saying it was good or bad. Right. I'm just curious your thoughts. Uh, We'll see. Uh, And then lastly, certainly not leastly, from the folks over at Dark Horse, uh, you've got Star Wars The High Republic. This is Phase 3, and this is titled Crash Landing from Daniel Jose Alder. Uh, You have got uh, Michael Ataya as the colorist, uh, and then you've also got uh, Rochelle Arrett. Aragno uh, is the artist, and this one reads, quote, Crash, Angua and her ragtag crew have been fighting against anyone who had a hand in the Nihil infiltration that plunged her home planet of Corellia into chaos. Even though an uneasy peace has been reached, if they don't continue to fight, everything they sacrificed for, for could slip away. Now, Crash has a lead on the person behind the entire Nihil plot. If her crew can comp- accomplish this mission, could true peace be on the horizon? Hmm. Probably not, but we'll yeah. see. It's Star Wars. There's there's never peace. I was going to say. Not for long, anyway. Yeah, there can't be peace. Otherwise, there'd be no stories. True. All right. On my end, ooh, loaded week at the comic shops this week. Kicking off DC Comics, one of my favorite series, and we're now at the penultimate issue. I can't believe it already. Alan Scott, The Green Lantern, number five. Tim hey. Sheridan, Kian Tormey, Matt Herms, and, and Lucas Catoni. Jesus, man, they're killing this series. Uh, this is... All the heartbreaking showdown between the red and green lantern where it spirals to you're not going to see coming and how they're set up for this finale like this is going to be something truly truly special i've been in love with the series since the jump and i'm telling you they have not faltered one bit here also coming from our friends over at skybound entertainment via image comics Duke number four. So if you are a G.I. Joe fan and you're not picking this up, I don't know what's wrong with you. To be honest with you, Joshua Williamson and Tom Riley have painted this amazing uh, introduction to Duke into the Energon universe. And this has something for everybody, but especially if you're an action fan, the stuff they do in this book is just next level. I absolutely adore the series to death. Like this is one of my favorite ones out there. Uh, a bittersweet book comes out this week, Pad. Oh, yeah? The Dead Lucky number 12. So, Melissa Flores, French Carlo Menno, this is Massive Verse, uh, Black Market Narrative, Image Comics. This, unfortunately, is the last issue for now. Oh. Um, so, you are getting the finale, and I want to stress for now, Melissa Flores put this uh, very big note in the back of the book that this BB will be coming back. Uh, did not give a timetable to give a details, but it's, okay. uh, but uh, if you know this the story... Uh, here, obviously, they've set up for the Battle of San Francisco. They're ending it uh, very strongly, and I, yeah, I would have to agree with Melissa. Like, I definitely see BB will be back at some point, but right. it's a great way to send her out for now. And I'm just, I want to very much emphasize that it's for now; it's not forever. So, definitely make sure you have that on your pull list when you hit the comic shops. Also, from Dark Horse Comics, man, one of my f- favorite series out right now, Masterpiece Number Four. So, this is Brian Michael Bendis, Alex Malav. We know them from uh, Scarlet, Daredevil. So this is the story about uh, Emma Masterpiece Lawford, whose parents have been these, the world's greatest thieves. Somebody who they've crossed is now coming back for revenge. This is a very cat and mouse game going on. Okay. Uh, very Ocean's Eleven-esque, like kind of the vibe here too. So really digging this and where they're setting everything up for. Like I really have enjoyed this. So if you like a good mystery story uh, going on here, I mean, creative team is killing it on here. And then... Last but certainly not least, Marvel. Um, obviously, we we talked a lot of X Men today. Yes, we did. Still going to talk some more because it's Rise of the Powers of Ten, number three. Kieran Gillen, R. B. Silva, and this is the future story that ties into the end of the Krakoan era because it's set ten years from current time. Ah, so and this one, Pat. I'm just going to show you the cover, and that kind of says it all. What the Christ! So if you know how the Krakoan era started, yeah, you'll see this cover, and you'll go. This is how it's ending, question mark. So the proposition that has been put forth, uh, desperate times call for extreme measures. 
what will Charles Xavier do? That's all I'm going to leave you at with that. So I'll definitely go check it out, though. Like I say, the the new era of X-Men is going to be kicking off this summer. Everything points for a monster 700-issue legacy happening in, late in June. So definitely don't miss your chance to check this out. A lot of big things are happening with the series. And as we always like to say, make sure and go out and support your LCS wherever you're at. Local comic shops are the best place to go for new comic book day. That being said, for anything and everything, it is the ODPH. You can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's it for entertainment this week. So for the one only, Pedro one j If you skip the X-Men 97 intro, we cannot be friends. I'm sorry. Rules are rules. I'm your host kind of, yeah, I second that fully. The fact that it's still an option. I just want to point it out there. Egregious. Egregious. So don't do that, folks. Make sure you watch the intro. Thank you as always for listening to the ODPH podcast. We'll see you next time. <laughs>